Chris Christofferson has been a hustling musician, a marquee concert draw, an actor, a sex symbol, an athlete, and a writer. But most of all, he's a legend. Here's the untold truth of Chris Christofferson. Chris Christofferson was born into a military family and spent his childhood moving from base to base. Eventually, though, they settled down in San Mateo, California, where Christofferson enrolled at Pomona College. He became a star athlete, excelling at football, rugby, and track and field, and earned the coveted Golden Gloves honor for his skill at boxing. But he was also a star student, and in 1958, he was awarded the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship, which sent him to Oxford University in England to study English literature. There, he began writing songs and performing in small venues, but pressure from his family forced him to give up his dreams and instead join the army. He quickly excelled there, too, becoming an army ranger and helicopter pilot. Eventually, he was offered the chance to teach English at the famed West Point Military Academy. But he had other ideas. Before accepting the position at West Point, Christofferson went on leave and decided to visit Nashville, the center of country music. A friend's cousin, Mary John Wilkin, was a songwriter there, and she liked some of Christofferson's tunes. The visit sealed it. Christofferson turned down the position at West Point quit the army and moved to Nashville to try to make it as a songwriter. He told Cowboys and Indians, I'd been writing songs since I was 11 years old and I knew immediately that this is where I belong. His family was appalled. His wife eventually divorced him and his parents disowned him. And he wasn't exactly an overnight success. While he honed his craft and tried to sell his songs, Christofferson made a meager living by working as a janitor at Columbia Records Studios in Nashville where he swept floors and emptied ashtrays used by the likes of George Jones, Bob Dylan, and Johnny Cash. Though Christofferson soon began selling an occasional song here or there, it wasn't enough to pay his bills, so he got a job as a helicopter pilot. Finally, five long years after arriving in Nashville, the floodgates opened and Christofferson became a sensation, thanks in part to one particularly bold stunt. While working as a janitor at the recording studio, he gave June Carter one of his demo tapes, but her husband, Johnny Cash, wasn't interested in listening to the songs. So Christofferson decided to make an impression. He flew his helicopter straight to Cash's house and landed it on his lawn. Cash claimed that Christofferson sauntered off the helicopter with a beer in one hand and a demo in the other, but Christofferson has said he doesn't remember Cash even being home at the time. Still, it worked. Cash listened to Christofferson's tune, Sunday Morning Coming Down, and decided to both record it and play it live on his hit TV show. The song became a smash sensation in 1970, just one of several mega-hits Christofferson would write that year and the next, including Loving Her Was Easier Than Anything I'll Ever Do Again, Help Me Make It Through the Night, and Me and Bobby McGee, which became a posthumous number one Billboard single for Christofferson's ex-lover Janis Joplin in 1971. Though Christofferson's own singing career was up and down, he continued to pen hit after hit in the early 70s. And he didn't just write great songs, he also had an ear for identifying talent in others. In 1971, Christofferson played a four-night stand at the Quiet Night Club in Chicago with Steve Goodman as his opening act. Each night, Goodman implored Christofferson to go across town to see a friend of his perform. Finally, on the last night, Christofferson relented and at 2 in the morning he got to hear an unknown singer-songwriter named John Prine play to a nearly empty club. Prine told Billboard, I got on the stage right in front of him and sang about seven songs, and then he bought me a beer and asked if I could get back up there and sing those seven again and anything else I wrote. Christofferson was convinced and soon introduced Prine to a number of key players in Nashville. It led to a record deal and soon Prine was recording his first album consisting of those same songs he had played for Christofferson in that empty nightclub. Brian told Billboard, It really was a Cinderella story, truly. In 2020, just months before he passed away, Prine was honored with a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award for a career that might not have happened were it not for the intervention of fellow musician Chris Christofferson. Equal parts celebrity, wandering troubadour, and restless artist, it shouldn't come as a surprise that Chris Christofferson has loved and lost love a few times. The singer-songwriter has been married several times, while also enjoying long and public romances with many of his 70s musical contemporaries, as well as other celebrities. Besides Janis Joplin, the Los Angeles Times reported that he also once dated Patti Davis, a writer and often estranged daughter of President Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan. Folk icon Joan Baez told the Chicago Tribune of her dalliance with Christofferson, while Carly Simon wrote in her memoir of a quote, slam-dunk deranged month or so spent with Christofferson. 
And at the height of Christofferson's fame, 1973 to 1980, he was married to fellow singing star Rita Coolidge, with whom he recorded the hit album Full Moon. Christofferson's swinging days are now long behind him, though, as he's been happily married to Lisa Myers since 1983. At the height of his music career, Christofferson took an unexpected detour into acting and soon became one of the biggest leading men in Hollywood. In the early 70s, he starred in several cult classics, including Sam Peckinpah's 1973 western Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid. Christofferson played the latter title character and earned a Most Promising Newcomer nomination at the BAFTA Awards. Peckinpah then recruited Christofferson to play a dangerous biker in his next feature, the underworld drama Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia. From there, Christofferson jumped to leading man status as rancher David, love interest for a world-weary waitress in Martin Scorsese's Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Able to play romantic leads while also boasting a musical background made Christofferson the perfect choice to play John Norman Howard, the fading rock star who discovers an exciting new talent played by Barbara Streisand in A Star Is Born, a remake of the 1937 and 1954 films. Christofferson won a Golden Globe for his performance. Just when it seemed like he was at his peak, though, one ill-fated role derailed and nearly destroyed his career. At the end of the 70s, Christofferson agreed to star in Heaven's Gate, a slow, meditative, experimental sort of western about a little-known land dispute in 1890s Wyoming. From the deer hunter filmmaker Michael Cimino, significantly over budget and past deadline, the film is regarded as one of the biggest bombs in Hollywood history. Suddenly, Christofferson was a Hollywood pariah. He told the Los Angeles Times, I'm sure it knocked me off the course I had been on right then. I think that it made me, for a while, unmarketable." Though his acting career was seemingly finished, Christofferson managed to get back on his feet musically with a little help from his friends. In 1984, Johnny Cash was filming the holiday TV special Christmas on the Road in Montreux, Switzerland, and he implored some friends and colleagues to join him. They just so happened to be three of the biggest names in country music — Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and, of course, Chris Christofferson. After taping all day, they'd head back to the studio to jam well into the evening, and according to Rolling Stone, they realized that they played together so well that they might as well form a supergroup and cut an album. The project was a landmark country event. Released in 1985 entitled Highwayman, the single of the same name hit number one on the country music chart, and the follow-up, Desperado's Waiting for a Train, hit number 15. The album's name soon became the group's name, sort of, The Highway Men. In addition to establishing themselves as tastemakers and the godfathers of modern country music and laying the groundwork for other monumental collaborations, the Highwaymen became a pop culture machine. The foursome also starred together in the 1986 made-for-TV movie Stagecoach and four discs worth of audio dramatizations for classic Louis L'Amour western stories, while releasing more albums in 1990 and 1995. Chris Christopherson's acting career got back on track in the 90s thanks in large part to an acclaimed role in the indie hit Lone Star, and that led to easily his best-known role as the fan-favorite badass Abraham Whistler in Blade. A man shattered by the loss of his entire family to vampires, he takes teenage vampire Blade into his care, gives him a serum he's developed to quell the blood hunger, and trains his young charge in his profession — vampire hunting. While the Blade trilogy is based on Marvel Comics characters, Whistler did not originate in print. Blade screenwriter David S. Goyer invented him. Goyer told the comics continuum, I thought it would be interesting for Blade to have a teacher, the aging gunfighter who passes down his knowledge. Goyer first considered Patrick McGowan or John Voight for the role, until he was blown away by Christofferson's performance in Lone Star. Christofferson so enjoyed playing Whistler that he returned for two Blade sequels. A cruel twist in the story of Chris Christofferson, a man whose life has been overstuffed with one adventure and accomplishment after another, for many years, he couldn't remember a lot of it. According to Rolling Stone, the singer-songwriter began to suffer memory loss in his 70s, which doctors originally attributed to either an encroaching case of Alzheimer's disease or dementia caused by repeated strikes to the head suffered during his days boxing and playing football and rugby when he was a high school and college student. Christofferson's mental deterioration got to the point where he'd forget what he was doing in the middle of activities, and his attempts to write a song about it faltered. In 2016, though, Christofferson got an unexpected ray of hope when he tested positive for Lyme disease. Proper treatment for that condition, along with dropping the strong medications he was taking for Alzheimer's, combined to largely restore Christofferson's mental acuity. His wife Lisa told Rolling Stone, "...some days he's perfectly normal, and it's easy to forget that he is even battling anything." 
Christofferson believes he first contracted the sickness from a tick bite he got while shooting the movie Disappearances in the Vermont Forest in 2006. Christofferson stands up for what he believes, a trait that has often gotten him in hot water with fans on both sides of the political divide. In the late 70s, the far left-wing Sandinistas successfully staged a revolution in Nicaragua. They faced violent resistance from the Contras, a group financially backed by the Ronald Reagan administration. Christofferson publicly favored the Sandinistas, even making trips to Nicaragua. He told the Washington Post, I'm a supporter. I know it's not hip to be. His support for left-wing causes cost him fans among the traditionally conservative country music fan base. And after he spoke out against the Gulf War in 1991, protesters picketed his shows. But Christofferson has angered progressives, too. In 1987, ABC aired America, a miniseries about life in the U.S. after a Soviet coup. Christofferson starred as a patriotic freedom fighter. Around that time, he attended a protest in Nevada one of among 2,000 opposed to the United States' Cold War move to resume nuclear testing. Christofferson told the Washington Post, As you can imagine, the place was full of people who were violently opposed to the film. This woman came up and said, You can't atone for America by doing this. So why did he take the role? Christofferson explained, I did not want to be involved in anything that increased Cold War tensions. But the fact is that the film was going to be made, and I felt that it was important that the part of the hero be played by somebody coming from my position. And that position, as always, is one of conviction. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stars are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.